You're watching Reason and Theology Live, a show dedicated to charitable discussions, debates, interviews, commentary, and analysis. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. Welcome back to Reason and Theology, everyone. I'm your host, Michael, on a Thursday morning. I want to continue engaging um, some comments from John MacArthur, a Protestant pastor, um, whenever he was criticizing the papacy in, uh, I guess, a talk that was back in 2005 that a um, patron has sent to me and would like for me to review. Um, this is one of those videos that I don't really have to do much engagement with. This is kind of one of those scenarios where you just need to let the person talk, and that says everything. I'm reminded of an episode from Star Trek The Next Generation. Uh, many of y'all know that I like I like Star Trek, especially TNG, The Next Generation. Um, you know you're a fan of Star Trek The Next Generation when you call it TNG, by the way, or that you know what TNG is. Uh, there's an episode called The Drumhead, which I think I actually had Jimmy Akin on the show before, and we discussed Star Trek and theology, and that was one of the episodes that we talked about. But The Drumhead is yeah, effectively about an admiral who comes on board who accuses Captain Picard, who's the captain of the ship, the Enterprise, accuses him of treason. And she brings up all kinds of um, you know, points that she believes is evidence of his treason. And towards the end of the episode, while Picard is on trial in front of the judge, in front of everyone, and while Admiral Sati is there accusing him, <clears throat> Picard does something interesting. He reads a quote from Admiral Sati's father, and he used her father's own words to show that what Admiral Sati was doing with a witch hunt, which is exactly what it was, was wrong. And whenever she, he quoted Admiral Sati's uh, words against her, she was angry, very livid, because she admired her father, and she realized here her father's words are being used against her. And at that point, the facade dropped, and she started to show her true colors, she did not believe that there was real evidence. She wasn't trying Picard because there really was tangible evidence. She just had this bias against Picard and assumed that he was guilty of treason and that anti Picardness came out. <laughs> Her hatred for Picard came out. And Picard did not have to object and respond to her arguments against him. All he had to do was sit there, be quiet, and let her rant. And the more and more she rant, uh, ranted, I guess is the correct tense there, uh, the more and more she showed her biases and how there wasn't really any foundation to her charges of treason, but that this was just simply a witch hunt and was due to her own hatred for Picard and biases and hatred for others. Um, at that point, when everybody saw where this was really coming from, what, what were the true motives of the charges of treason, the judge just walks out of the room. He, he didn't need to hear any more. He realized, okay, I see where this is coming from, as did everyone else. Picard walks out, everyone else walks out, the trial is over. There, there was no foundation, no basis for the accusations of treason. And the lesson is, Sometimes you don't really have to engage a person point by point. You just have to let them talk. Now, <laughs> I'm not going to, for the sake of fair use laws, just show um, a video and just let MacArthur talk because, again, with, with fair use, you have to interact with it. So I will interact, but I say that to say I don't really think a whole lot of interaction is really required for what we're about to hear. I think you just have to listen. 
but again, as I say, for the for the sake of fair use, <laughs> I'll interact a little bit. Um, <clears throat> let me share my screen here and uh, play the video. We're starting around 48 minutes, 53 second timestamp. Um, for exposing the heresy of Roman Catholicism, the Pope and the Papacy, May 1st, 2005, John MacArthur. Um, so let's go ahead and begin. If you want to know what he believes about Scripture, that I'll give you a little. Uh, John Paul II, like all Roman Catholics since the Council of Trent, flatly denied that Scripture is the supreme authority in all matters of faith, conduct, and doctrine. The words of Vatican II, quote, the Roman Catholic Church does not draw her certainty about all revealed truth from the Holy Scriptures alone. But both Scripture and tradition must be accepted and honored with equal feelings of devotion and reverence. Now, did you hear that? I think that he just misinterpreted. It says we don't draw our certainty. The reason why is there's also an oral transmission of the same content of scripture that doesn't mean that there's additional content it just means there's an oral transmission of the same content which helps us to interpret the scriptures that doesn't mean that scripture um, is somehow subservient to the magisterium or um, the word of god is is somehow reduced or that even the oral transmission is greater than scripture he just read into what vatican II is saying and if he had <clears throat> read the uh, rest of Vatican II, he would read De Verbum, paragraph 10, which talks about how the word of God is not something that is subservient to the magisterium. It's the magisterium that's subservient to the word of God. And it's the same content that's in uh, scripture that is also in the oral transmission and vice, vice versa. So it's, it's the same content. So it's not putting the oral transmission of the word of god i.e tradition as over scripture not at all so that that's all that vatican ii is saying and i think that every protestant has to agree to that because prior to the gospel message having been written down there was the gospel message being proclaimed an oral transmission being preached <clears throat> That message that was preached is equal to what was written down because it's the same message. So I think that even a Protestant who's being fair with what Vatican II is saying here has to admit that it's true. But if you have these biases and you're just reading into things, well, you're going to come away with conclusions like MacArthur. What it really comes down to is you deny what the Scripture says, you twist and pervert what the Scripture says, and you invent another religion based upon tradition. The Catholic Church says tradition is equal to Scripture, and the Catholic Church determines what is tradition. Um, so, <clears throat> again, the question now is going to be, prior to Scripture having, you know, the Word of God having been written down in Scripture, was there a church? Yes. Um, and this New Testament or New Covenant community, prior to things having been written down, was it proclaiming the gospel of Jesus? Yes. Was that message the word of God? Yes. See what we're getting at? She also says, does the church, that the popes determine the true meaning of Scripture, and they alone know the true meaning of Scripture. That's actually not what is, is said. Um... <clears throat> what is said, however, by the Catholic Church, and it is reiterated at Vatican II, um, especially in the document Lumen Gentium, is that the Catholic Church in its teaching authority, so the bishops, for example, uh, collectively, are authentic interpreters of the Word of God. Authentic here means authoritative. They're authoritative because Christ has given them the authority to do this. Specifically, he has given them that task and that commission. Um, we could work through the proofs to substantiate that, but that's the claim that's being made by the Catholic Church. So that doesn't mean that you can't engage in private interpretation or have access to the truth as a private individual. But what's being said is that 
it's a private interpretation. It's not an authoritative interpretation that you can impose on others. That is what is meant by authoritative or authentic interpreters on part of the magisterium. It's, it's a binding uh, interpretation. Not that it's the only interpretation that is able to penetrate and access the truth, but it's the one that's authoritative. So I, as a private individual, can access the truth by reading scripture, but that doesn't mean that my interpretation is going to be binding on others. That's the claim that is being made by the Catholic Church, not what John MacArthur is saying here. And the meaning that they determine to be the true meaning is infallible. So um, now, authentic interpretation on part of the bishops could be infallible. But as we know, and as Lumen Gentium itself tells you, there are authoritative judgments of the church that are not infallible. They are not infallible acts of the magisterium. So again, if you actually read Lumen Gentium and really read what the church is saying, it tells you these things. So these misun misunderstandings on part of John MacArthur, in my opinion, are inexcusable because he's trying to critique the Second Vatican Council. But in my estimation, I don't think he's actually read it. And if he's read some of it, I'd really question whether or not he understands it. So you have a man who claims to be the head of the church, the vicar of Christ. He arrogates to himself an authority that belongs to God alone. So does the Pope arrogate an authority to himself that belongs to God alone? Um, whenever he claims to be the head of the church. Well, again, this goes back to um, concepts like does a visible head or a vicarious head somehow negate another head? No. Um, is man the head of, you know, is a husband the head of his family? Yes. But is not Christ also the head of that family? Yes. They're, they're not diametrically opposed. So just having a visible head or a vicarious head doesn't negate that Jesus is also a head. The question now is, but has Jesus actually given the Pope that authority to be a visible or vicarious head? That's the question. Not that one would negate the other, but did he in fact do this? Or is this something, as MacArthur said, uh, the Pope has arrogated to himself? Well, the claims of the New Testament would put Peter as head of the apostles. And you see that distinction being made in Matthew 16, which, again, makes a distinction between him being singled out exclusively, as opposed to Matthew 18, uh, where authority is also given to the apostles, but collectively. And then the question is, okay, well, that headship of Peter, does that continue in the successors? And are there successors of Peter? Well, I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. We've done this many times on the show where we've spoken about um, apostolic succession and Petrian authority. So I'll just refer you to the papacy uh, playlist on, on this video. But I think that there's a really strong case that is not only made scripturally, but also historically for the papacy. So I would just push back and say, no, this is not an authority that the Pope has... Uh, claimed for himself, but is actually something that Christ has bestowed on him. He feels free to interpret Scripture any way he wants to, and it is infallible. And in the process, of course, abandons the plain sense of Scripture that teaches Christ alone is the way to salvation by faith alone. Well, enough about him. Let me uh, kind of conclude with just looking at the papacy itself. Because he's representative of it. Oh, I, he's not as um, deadly as some popes have been, not as immoral as some popes have been. He, uh, he's a nobler soul, humanly speaking, than many. But let me just talk about what uh, the papacy affirms for itself. And I have a source for this, The Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma by Ludwig Ott, written in 1952 and into English, translated in 1955. It's... I have a concern that MacArthur often points to Ludwig Ott. I, I think he's a good secondary source, but I do question why MacArthur continues to go to secondary sources instead of just the primary sources. 
Is it perhaps because he hasn't studied the primary sources? From what I'm hearing from MacArthur, and the reason why he relies on limbic God is, to me, it sounds like he hasn't studied the primary sources. And I'd rather go to the primary sources than Ludwig God. But, okay, we can engage a secondary source. Let's hear him out. Been a staple in my own understanding of Catholic theology for years. You hear our statements of Catholic dogma from that primary source. The Pope possesses full and... Um... Ludwig Ott wouldn't be a primary source. Um, unless you're somehow doing a thesis on Ludwig Ott or something. But if, if you're talking about Catholicism, Ludwig Ott would be a secondary source. So I'm not sure why he refers to him as a primary source here. And, and again, that is, I'm not just making mountains out of molehills here. I, I, I'm a little troubled by that, that he's relying on secondary sources instead of going to primary sources. Secondary sources are great. They're helpful. We need them. And you shouldn't read primary sources to the exclusion of secondary sources. You need both. But I am concerned whenever someone only relies on secondary sources rather than primary sources. Supreme power of jurisdiction over the whole church, not merely in matters of faith and morals, but also in church discipline and in the government of the church. The Vatican Council declared, interpreting that, if anyone shall say that the Roman pontiff has the office merely of inspection and direction and not a full and supreme power of jurisdiction over the universal church, not only in things which belong to faith and morals, but also in those which relate to the discipline and government of the church spread throughout. Did you hear that? Not only jurisdiction over faith and morals, but also discipline and government of the church. I think some radical traditionalists need to hear that. I think they really need to pay attention to that part. The world or asserts that he possesses merely the principal part and not the fullness of this supreme power or that this power which he enjoys is not ordinary and immediate, both over each and all the churches and over each and all the pastors. And Ordinary and immediate. I really think some radical traditionalists need to listen to that. Because I'm hearing stuff that's pushing back on um, what Vatican I says about the immediacy um, of the uh, Pope's authority um, over you know, the territory of other bishops. It's very reminiscent of the Eastern Orthodox objections against the papacy, um, oddly enough. And the faithful, let him be anathema. You question his authority in any sense, and you're cursed. It's a mortal. Is that actually what it says? Um, so Vatican I there in Pastor Eternus, I believe, is, is where that came from. Um, I'd have to go and double check. I'm pretty sure that was Pastor Eternus. But I know for sure it was Vatican I that Ludwig Odd is quoting. But um, so... Is it saying if you question the Pope in any way, you're going to hell? It's a mortal sin. You're cursed by God. Is that that's not even what anathema means at Vatican I? Um, it doesn't automatically translate into you're cursed by God and it's mortal sin. That's not what an anathema um, is. Um, that may be how Paul's using the term anathema in Galatians, but certainly not how Vatican I is using the, the term of anathema. So I'd offer some pushback there. Um, but moreover, does this mean that you could never question the Pope for, from what we just heard? No, that's that doesn't logically follow from what we just heard. Um, it means you could not outright dissent. But is questioning and offering some uh, pushback, does that equal dissent? No, because I could obey a pope while still questioning and challenging him. I could say, Pope, you have the authority to do this and I will obey you. But I ask that you consider whether or not this is the most prudential decision to make, that this is a good exercise, a good use of your authority, or if there is a better approach that can be taken. You see how questioning does not equal dissent? And disobedience those are two different things uh, so i just gave you an example of how you could do what macarthur says you can't do and yet i'm not falling under the condemnation um that is expressed there by vatican one all right sin he's unassailable 
It goes on to say, a true power, a universal power, a supreme power, and a full power is possessed by any pope who can, quote, rule independently on any matter without the consent of anyone else. He himself is judged by nobody because there is no... Yeah, and here, of course, we're talking about an authoritative judgment, not, you know, a private judgment as to his the use of um, his disciplinary decisions. I mean, I, I can question whether or not the Pope has um, best used his office as Pope without disobeying him. There's no higher judge on earth than he. He's the king of the earth. There is no one who can authoritatively judge the Pope. And that's that follows from the commission that is given to Peter, specifically in the Gospels. Um, so this would be the structure that Jesus himself instituted. Um, so if what Catholics are saying is true about Peter and the Pope, it would follow then that there's no... Um, authoritative structure over the Pope. And that's what Vatican I is getting at. Um, councils aren't over the Pope um, in, in so far as they could judge him uh, collectively apart from the Bishop of Rome. And if you mention Honorius, you'll note that they weren't judging the Bishop of Rome apart from the Bishop of Rome. They were judging a previous Bishop of Rome in union with that current Bishop of Rome at the time. Uh, so uh, the case of Honorius wouldn't, wouldn't work here. And even if you were to point to a council that tries to judge the Pope apart from the Bishop of Rome, this is something that is condemned by Rome itself. So the, it, it pushes the question back to, well, does Rome actually have the authority that it claims? And that's when I just refer you to the papacy playlist where we've done many, many videos substantiating that. That's why the Vatican is a, its own nation, because he can't submit to any monarch. He is the king of the world. Further, Catholic dogma says the Pope is infallible when he speaks ex cathedra, ex cathedra, cathedra is chair or seat, ex when he speaks out of his seat. When he speaks as Pope, he is infallible. That's actually not true. Um, it's partially true, but not entirely true, um, because the way ex cathedra is defined by Vatican I is not that he's just speaking as Pope, but that he's speaking as Pope on a matter of faith and morals to the universal church in such a way that he binds the universal church. Those are, those are three conditions. Um, if two of those are absent, it wouldn't be actually ex cathedra. So just because he's speaking as the Pope doesn't make it infallible, uh, because again, if, if you read Lumen Gentium, um, it actually tells you explicitly that the Pope can teach, but he's not teaching with an infallible charism in some conditions. So what I've heard MacArthur just do is he took the definition of Vatican I and reduced it to something that isn't true. Um, and then he's going to knock down that straw man. Well, it's easy to do that whenever you're redefining what we mean by papal infallibility. If you redefine terms and and mean you know define papal infallibility in a way we don't believe, yeah, you can refute it pretty easily. But if you actually engage what we mean by papal infallibility as outlined by Pastor Eternus in Vatican I, it's a lot harder to try to invalidate. Catholic dogma says God in heaven will confirm the Pope's judgment. Which is a concept that's again based on based on Matthew. Um, 16, 18 through 19, um, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And it's not only a, a, the it's not only the Pope who's able to do that, it's also the bishops um, in unity with the Pope collectively. Um, so I'm not sure why Protestants always tend to focus so much on the Pope as if he's the only one who can do this. We, we make the same claims about the bishops. In his capacity of supreme doctor of the faith, he is preserved from error. By the way, papal infallibility was voted in in 1870. That was convenient. So um, it was solemnly defined as a dogma in 1870, um, but it was held to be something that was definitive prior to that. Um, so much before 1870 was held to be definitive. 
but it was actually solemnly um, declared to be a dogma in 1870. And the reason why is there were people who were pushing back on it, um, promoting conciliarism. So it was necessary to offer a definition. In the same way that in 325, you have uh, Jesus you know, being solemnly, it, it's solemnly defined that Jesus is uh, homo usias, but the father. But it doesn't mean that that's somehow a truth that only came about in 325. That's certainly not the case, but it became necessary to offer a solemn definition whenever there arose enough confusion in the church over the matter. Same thing with papal infallibility. And it was voted in by a split vote. Interesting. Not, not necessarily because they were in denial of papal infallibility, but there were other issues involved. But they had to vote several times to finally get it through, and it never was unanimous. Yeah, see, I, I don't accept this portrayal of the First Vatican Council and its history. John Paul uh, II apologized for the historical failings of Catholics in a very vague way, because when he was confronted with some of the issues of the past, some of the embarrassing things like forced conversion and anti-Semitism and some of the horrible things that were done, he apologized in a vague way. And, and you have to understand this. Now, how can you apologize if you're infallible? Did you hear that? Is that what we mean by papal infallibility? That a pope is unable to apologize for anything that popes have done or bishops have done or laity has done? Is that how Pastor Eternus defines papal infallibility? No. Papal infallibility doesn't mean papal impeccability. And, I mean, that's just been said a million times that it's it's kind of one of those things that it's, do we even really need to say that? I mean, evidently we do. Uh, but, yeah, papal infallibility doesn't mean papal impeccability. Papal infallibility is limited to the three conditions that I gave. Um, outside of those, you could have error and you could even have sin on part of some popes. So for a pope to apologize, does it mean that that invalidates the claims to papal infallibility it, as long as we're defining them as Vatican I? Now, if you just redefine your terms to mean anything, yeah, you, you can create a straw man and knock it down like MacArthur just did. Sure. But that's not being fair to us and it's not being honest with our, our material. How can an infallible church apologize but yeah so i'm sure he believes actually that the church as a whole collectively is is infallible I, i'm in some sense i think that he would believe that even as a protestant i don't think that he would believe the sum total of all the elect could be deceived or something like that so he, he has to hold to some kind of infallibility and yet he would also recognize that there are sins on part of the members of the church and so Again, MacArthur affords himself that distinction. I, I don't know why he doesn't afford us that distinction. But listen to what they believe. They do not believe that the church consists in the laity. The church does not consist in the laity. You'll notice he doesn't really give us a, a, a source for that. And, and that's factually untrue. The church consists of all of the faithful, whether they are members of the hierarchy or laity. Um, a very simple cursory reading of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which was available by 2005, um, a very simple cursory reading of the section on the church in the Catechism would have dispelled this misunderstanding. So what he's doing is he's redefining, redefining how we understand the word church. He's giving it a definition that's foreign to us. It's not something that we accept. He's not giving us a source for it, and he's going to set that straw man up and knock him down. Watch. The laity are the sons and daughters of the church, but the church is the Roman curia, the papal court of cardinals, bishops, and priests. Okay, so the church is the Roman curia, the cardinals, and did he say bishops and priests? Let, let, let me listen to that one one more time. Um, let's see. That the church consists in the laity. The church does not consist in the laity. The laity are the sons and daughters of the church, but the church is the Roman curia, the papal court of cardinals, bishops, and priests. Papal court of cardinals, bishops, and priests. 
papal, let me write this down, court of bishops. Um, oh, I, I think he said cardinals, bishops, and priests. Oh, in the, in the Roman congregations, Roman congregations. Uh, so the, our definition of, of the church here, according to the Catholic Church, is the Roman congregations, the papal court of cardinals, bishops, and priests. Let, again, aside from the fact that this is not actually how we define uh, the church, and you could easily access that through just very um, basic expositions of what we believe, like the Catechism of the Catholic Church, putting that one to the side, let me dissect this for a moment. So Roman congregations. So prior to the Roman congregations, that means that we didn't believe in a church. So pri prior to the Roman congregations, which is relatively recent in, in, in church history, I mean, you certainly don't have Roman congregations in the year 400. So he would say that according to us, we don't believe that there was a church prior to, I don't know, uh, the advent of the Roman congregations, which again is relatively recent. That's how he's portraying us because uh, this is evidently an essential um, part of the definition to put Roman congregations in there. I mean, when, whenever you give me a definition of something, I, I would assume everything in, in there is essential. I, I would assume you're not giving me an accidental feature in a definition. So Roman congregations, is that what we believe? We believe that those are essential to the definition of the church? The papal court, let's just stop there. And I'll tackle in a moment how he's defining papal court. But So prior to the advent of the papal court, we didn't believe that there was a church. Is, is that what we're going to say? Okay. All right. And then we're defining the papal court as the papal court of cardinals, which, again, don't come around until the second millennium. So I guess prior to that, we don't believe that there's a church in MacArthur's eyes. The papal court of cardinals, bishops, and priests. Um, now, I do know that there are different classes of cardinals <laughs> that we, we could talk of as bishop cardinals, priest cardinals, and that doesn't mean that they're, you know, sacramentally a bishop or a priest, but rather it's, it's more of a... Um, a category of cardinals who are bishops, but uh, cardinal bishops, cardinal priests, who are all bishops. Again, it's just kind of a hierarchy or a status uh, among the bishops. Um, but I don't think that's what he means. He says cardinals, comma, bishops and priests. Um, so we, we don't have any um, priests in the College of Cardinals. I mean, it's possible to, but we don't have any. So not only do I not recognize this definition as true, neither does he give us any sources, but um, I don't see where he could even possibly get this from because to my knowledge, we don't have any priests among the College of Cardinals. But this is, again, certainly not how we define the church, which is, again, easily accessible in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And when John Paul II apologizes for the historic failings of the Catholics, uh, of the Catholics, he is not meaning the infallible Church that consists in the papacy and the Curia. They are not guilty, for they are always to be held as immaculate. The infallible Church consists in the papacy and the Curia. What about ecumenical councils and bishops? I mean, they're they're not in the. Papal Curia, I mean, are, are they not infallible in the Catholic Church? Um, what about the ordinary and universal magisterium? Is there not an infallibility there? But okay, um, papal, the, the Pope and the Papal Curia, um, we wouldn't say that Roman congregations or the Curia um, participate in the charism of infallibility. Um, whenever they issue documents, um, they can't authoritatively teach anything on their own. Um, they're only authoritative insofar as they're participating in his ordinary magisterium, which is not infallible. But the Pope could then give um, 
uh, could take a document and then issue it on his own authority infallibly. And anytime we speak maybe of a, a Roman congregation, um, we, we can speak of it being free from error in a very qualified sense, not in the way that the Pope is with the charism of infallibility, but only an infallible safety. Um, insofar as the Roman congregations, with the with approval, obviously, of, of the Pope, wouldn't promulgate something universally that is um, harmful to souls. That That's the only way that we could, that's as far as we could go with um, the curia. So um, so it was inappropriate to, to include the curia there in the definition of um, the church's infallibility. Moreover, it's the big elephant in the room was we're missing the, the College of Bishops, which, which are also able to exercise infallibility. But then he translated infallibility. Did you hear it? He translated infallibility as immaculate. Is that what infallibility is? Is it immaculate? No. Number one, infallibility only applies under certain conditions. Um, short of those conditions, certainly not immaculate. Uh, it could have error. And then number two, even when those conditions are present and the charism of infallibility is operative, does that mean immaculate? No. Because what is meant by infallibility? Um, what is meant by infallibility is that it is free from error, not that it is expressing something in the best possible way. Immaculate would mean you're expressing something in the best possible way. Infallible would just simply mean not necessarily that you're expressing it in the best possible way, but uh, that what you the substance of the proposition would be free from there. So there's a fundamental difference between infallibility and being immaculate or impeccability, if you will. Um, so I, I wonder where this is coming from. It's certainly not coming from the Catholic Church. The sins have been committed by the sons and daughters of the church who make up the laity. This is absolutely ridiculous. So he's saying whenever John Paul II apo apologized for certain sins of the church, he was only apologizing for certain sins of the laity, not of the um, the priests or the bishops or the popes. That's not true. Factually, that's not true. Um, and I also, again, I don't know where he's getting this from. It, it's certainly not from any of our sources on how we understand the church. But... I mean, this is fascinating to hear. That this is what he thinks about us. It, all right, so no pope has ever apologized for anything a bishop or a priest has ever done. They only apologize for sins of the laity because the laity aren't actually members of the church. Is that really accurate? Given the sexual perversion of the priesthood, which even Benedictus the Sixteenth tried to... Benedictus the Sixteenth. Nice. <clears throat> sweep under the rug with a silly comment about, well, the percentage of uh, perverted priests, and he wouldn't use that word, but the percentage of pedophile priests is no different than the normal population. I don't think that Benedict XVI was sweeping anything under the rug. Um, and I, I certainly don't think that any of this means that none of the popes have apologized for things that priests have done or recognized that priests could err. Um, it's certainly not the case that we believe priests are infallible or impeccable or immaculate or even that bishops are immaculate or even that popes are immaculate. All of this is brushed under the carpet as fast as it can be in an effort to protect the illusion of holiness. Really is, is that what Catholics are doing? We're trying to protect the illusion of holiness so we're sweeping everything under the rug. Again, I have to offer some interaction to for this fall, to fall under fair use. But I, do I really have to, though? Um, is it not possible for us to just listen to this and hear, kind of like Admiral Sati and Captain Picard, as I mentioned at the beginning there? Some things, you know, do you really have to actually engage? Is it not possible to just hear what the person says and then you realize, ah, I see where you're I think that's what we heard just now. 
I think we add an Admiral Sati moment here. And again, if you don't know what I'm talking about, go and watch the first the, the first part of this uh, video. And then also watch the drum head. It's called the drum head on Star Trek, the next generation. And I would say John MacArthur is Admiral Sati here. These are trumped up charges. These are baseless charges. Um, and it sounds to me like it's motivated by an anti-Catholicism and certain biases. It's certainly not coming from any sources of the Catholic Church. I didn't hear any real engagement with Catholicism. At best, I heard him trying to interact with a secondary source. But then he goes much beyond what the secondary source says and reads a whole lot more into it. So I didn't see an honest interaction even with the uh, secondary source there. Very troubling to hear. Um, <clears throat> let, me, uh, let me see here. I wanted to check the um check the chat here somebody says i never noticed michael's tattoos before what do they read well um it, i have a window unit in here an air conditioner window unit and a fan going but um it is well the thermostat says still 90 degrees so it's 90 degrees in here uh the window unit is struggling against the heat but it's a thousand square feet in here um and then it's probably i don't know so maybe a 15 foot ceiling so there's is a lot to heat up or, or cool down um <laughs> and so the ac is struggling so i can't wear long sleeve i'm sorry i just i can't do it I'm, it's it's too much which which has been interesting because since it's so hot and i can't wear long sleeves i've had multiple people come in the comment section and tell me that i'm going to hell because i have tattoos uh, one person says that they know that i have a demon because i have tattoos such people are immediately blocked on this channel. Um, th these are people that I don't think belong on this channel. Um, so just a fair warning, anybody who comments with something like that, ah, well, you can expect to be blocked. Um, mm -hmm. Looking through the chat. Um, if y'all want to send some questions, I'll take some for just a few minutes. Make sure to put them to at reason and theology. Um, what do we have here? I see some good comments. Um, Franciscus the first. I see you slayed, enslaved by truth. I see you. John MacArthur equals no beard. Ah, the beard controversy. We're back to that one. East and West. <laughs> the battle of the beards. <laughs> um, let's see. Let's see some interesting comments. Uh, Jay Pronomas, good morning and hello everyone. Good morning to you. Hope you all are enjoying this video. And uh, this will probably be the last one that I do on MacArthur for a while. I appreciate the patron that sent these to me, uh, but I'm a little burned out on MacArthur at this point. So uh, the patron sent me a lot more. Uh, I, I think this will be, be good for now. Uh, maybe at some point we'll, we'll revisit him. Um, if, if, if someone has no beard, I give them no hear, ear. <laughs> Well, that's going to create a problem for some of the pubs, right? <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, Alex says, I'm burnt out on, on the MacArthur videos as well. Well, yeah, you know, I I can understand it. Uh, are the books okay in 90 degrees? The better question is, are the cameras and the computer and all the other equipment okay in 90 degrees? That's my bigger concern. Um, I might need to get a second window unit in here at this point um, because that that one, I mean, it's fine. It, it does fine. But now we're getting into like really, really, really high uh, temperatures and it's struggling hard. <laughs> um, so. Um. I don't see any questions, so might just uh, might just leave it there. 
uh, Alex, Alex says he's burned out on the times doing the timestamps. Yeah, so well, hey, I appreciate you sending me those. Uh, heat and humidity don't mix with technology. Well, I know I'm struggling with that over here. What do I do? Um, at least it's way better now that I have it. Yeah, I have the AC unit in here. It was interesting last year when I didn't have it and I was doing shows with no AC in 95 degree weather. That was really interesting. <laughs> but yeah, like I said, I, I gotta I gotta wear the long or the short sleeves right now. I try to do the long sleeves if there's you know somebody I'm interviewing, but man, on these solo shows, it's just like uh no, I'm, I'm just going to wear my short sleeves. And then I get anathematized by all the scrupulous people. So, um, But it's good because it kind of lets me know the people that need to be blocked anyway. So it, it kind of brings them out. FYI, by the way, for all the bots that are watching right now <laughs> or something, you know, all the porn bots, uh, please be aware that I'm immediately blocking your comments whenever you put those in the comment section promoting pornography and porn websites. I'm immediately going to block those. Um, so you you can just stop now. <laughs> it would be nice if you stop posting with three different accounts on every one of my videos. I would appreciate it. It would save me an extra step. But even if you're not going to, you're immediately getting blocked. So if if any bots are listening right now and any of you bots are sentient and actually understand what I'm saying, please take that under advisement. <laughs> um, <laughs> Jay Pranovas has sun and alligators next to Louisiana. Yeah, I've seen some alligators before. I have. I don't have any nearby. Well, I wonder if there are some in the washed out river, but... Um, there, there aren't any immediately nearby. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, <laughs> there, there's some, there's some good comments here in the chat. I always enjoy reading, reading the comment section here. Uh, you, you guys definitely keep me entertained. All right, we'll, we'll go ahead and end it there, though. I appreciate y'all watching, and uh, thanks for the interaction here in the chat and uh cheer, keep, keeping my day cheerful with with the interaction hey make sure to subscribe to this channel if you haven't already share this on your facebook and your twitter and uh, any other social media help spread the word about reason and theology and also check me out at patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you want to uh support what i'm doing here since this is my income um this is how i provide for my family so i would appreciate it also Check me out at the MaximusInstitute.com where I'm offering a course on understanding the magisterium. It's the website scrolling here at the bottom. So if you want to learn more about the Catholic magisterium and how it works, check out that course at that website. I do see a super chat. Let me grab it. Thank you for blocking the porn bot. Save us time. Right. Yeah. Um, although if you catch them before I do, go ahead and report them. But I'll still, I still catch them. So uh, fret not. All right. I appreciate it, y'all. And uh, th again, thank you for the interaction. And that's going to do it. We'll see you later. God bless.